Good morning, Trinity Church. Welcome on this first Sunday of the new year. I'm so excited to worship God together and all the different gatherings that we'll have this year. And as we get things started here, please stand with us. I'm going to read from Psalm 96. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised.
Let's ask the Lord for great things in 2018. There's no limit to God's power and what he can do. So let's ask. There is no limit to your power. There is no stopping what you plan. You give us faith to move the mountains. Hope to dream again. giving way to light the glory of your grace advance let it burn up the night let it burn up the night turn around before you're seated, say good morning and happy new year to those around you.
Hey, and I get to say it too. Happy New Year. So I'll bet I've heard that more times than most of you have because last week I went to the Rose Bowl Parade and I heard Happy New Year 9,000 times. Every float that goes by, everybody's like, Happy New Year, Happy New Year, Happy New Year. We're all going, yep. <laughs> So it is, though, we're excited to be here, and we're starting a new series today called Inverted. And I love that. Uh, I don't know the, who did the artwork, but it's awesome. And we're going to have a great time together. This is one of those times of the year when many of us kind of say, hmm, I'm thinking about some changes in my life, thinking of, of some things maybe I want to do different this year. And for some of you, I want to say, this is going to be a great, great year for us, and we want to make those changes with you. We want to walk together. We talk a lot about doing life and mission together, and we really mean that. We really are doing life together because so much is going on all the time. One of the best ways of us to do life together is to not just come in here on Sunday mornings, but during the week someplace, get together in a small group. We have all kinds of small groups here. We have things called home groups. I don't know if you've uh, already are in one. There's women's groups, men's groups, support groups. There's high school groups, middle school groups. We have groups of all varieties. That's where we get to be up close and personal and real with each other and do life. And so I just want to encourage you, if you haven't yet gotten into a group, all you have to do is say, I'm interested in being in a group on one of those welcome cards. It's in the seat back right in front of you there. Now, for those of you who are new to Trinity, you're going, okay, I don't know that I'm ready to jump into a group yet, but I'd like to know some more information about Trinity. Fill out that same welcome card. Drop it in the offering at the end of the hour. We would love to have you just get connected with us and get started in doing some things. And there's so much good going on. And you'll notice in Trinity this week that there's, if you look at it, there's kind of a new format in there. It's even bigger ads, better ads, lots of color, lots of good things going on. And I just want to urge you to check this out and find out what the Lord is doing here at Trinity Church. Now, one of the things that you'll notice on just inside here, it says kids family picnic. Now, that's for families who have kids uh, from birth all the way through fifth grade. We'd love, love to have you come back next week for a family picnic. Now, on the other side of the page, it says what's happening on Sunday uh, the 14th. You'll notice that there it tells you what to bring for that picnic because, you not you know, it's not just to come and eat. It's a come and bring some food and eat. So we'd love to have you come back next week for that. Now, um, one of the things I, I just, we, we just say this over and over. Our God is big. He's great. He's powerful. He's also very personal. And he answers our prayers. He does. There's just so much that the Lord is doing. We see it all the time. And we're going to pray together this morning. And at the bottom of that page there, you'll notice there, there's an overseas spotlight. And that's on um, Mazar, Mazar and Christine Malui. I've known them for years. They're super brave family. They're in some of the most difficult places of the world, bringing the good news to people. So we're going to pray for them this morning. We join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, there's just so much happening every day. Thank you, God, that we get to wake up every day with the hope of knowing Jesus. We know that we're going to be with him forever. He's going to come again. Our Lord God, today I pray for us as a congregation. Will you make this truly a blessed year, a happy year, a year of knowing your joy, your love, and taking it out to the world, sharing it with the people around us, that we really do have all of our sin and shame washed away through him. And not only that, we have all the love we've ever wanted is right there with him. Lord God, I pray for Mazar and Christine as they share this in the difficult places of the world where they are. Um, I pray for them, Lord God, because this is a family who's given themselves to taking the gospel into high-risk places. We pray for them that you would continue to not only provide for their safety and strength, but even more so, Lord God, give them the joy and the good cheer of knowing Jesus every day. We pray for this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. 
As Steve mentioned, we're in the midst of a new series starting on this new year, Inverted. And this series is, is going to be digging into the book of Daniel, the story of Daniel and his friends. And uh, Steve wrote this in the notes, the small group notes that are in your worship folder in the back. It says, pray. It says, throughout Daniel, trusting God is always connected with prayer. To help us pray, we're going to text out prayer notes throughout the weeks. And there's a way to opt in. And so that's here, but I'm going to encourage you. This is something that you can do right now. I'm going to show you how to do it in a minute. But you know, we have a prayer team. And these people, men and women, their job is to help keep us focused on prayer and growing in prayer, both individually and as a community here at Trinity Church. And so they've got a few things that are planned for us. The first starts next Sunday. It's an evening night of worship and prayer. And uh, so I encourage you to come out for that. It's going to be a great time of worshiping the Lord with songs and then moving out and being led in different prayer stations to focus on some specific areas where we can pray together. And I guarantee that if you come out for this, you're going to be enriched and encouraged by our time together. And it's going to be followed up with, with a hot chocolate bar. And so there's time just to visit together as well. So that's next weekend, right in this room, Sunday night, the 14th. The other thing is this prayer initiative. These are texts that you can sign up for. And during the week, we're all going to be praying for the same things. That thing's going to come to you. The first one is scheduled for today at 5 o'clock. You're going to get a text, and we're all going to pray for that together. And I would encourage you to do that. If you know that it's something you want to do, I'm going to lead you in doing it right now. So take out that phone. All you need to do is open your message app. Start a new message. In the title two, you're going to type 81010. And then in the message where you put your text, you're going to just type at TC Prayer. And my phone's already starting to buzz that, hey, you've got new people signing up. So that's awesome. And you guys are going to be blessed by this. We're going to be blessed because it's going to focus us and unite us in prayer during the year. So um, we'll see you next Sunday for that as well. Chris. All right. So for this next song, we're going to receive the offering. And uh, you know, this is one of the ways that, that we worship the Lord is through our giving of our, of our tithes. And I uh, want to remind you uh, or let you know, if you're a guest with us this morning, please don't feel obligated to give and just be our guest. Um, and we're, gonna, we're actually going to do this for a new song. Uh, it's a song that just totally focuses our gaze and our eyes on Christ, mm. and it's called Look to the Sun. So as, as uh, the basket passes by, feel free to stand with us and sing. It's just a celebration and a declaration that, that we'll commit our lives and our gaze to the Lord. Let's sing this out together. One, two, three, four. Oh, we look to the sun. Shadows fade into nothing as the day appears. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out.
shining like the rising sun. Now forever, lifted up from death to life. There's no fear in love and no darkness, it is endless light. Amen. Beyond the skies above.
Fellowship. The fellowship. The fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of His. I won't look back, let up. Back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I am finished and done with low living. Sight walking. Smooth knees, colorless dreams. Tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, or popularity. I don't have to be right, recognized, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer, and labor with power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few, but my guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. Hesitate in the presence of the enemy. Pander at the pool of popularity. Or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must keep going until he comes. Give until I drop. Preach until all know. And work until he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. Amen. Very cool. We're so glad you're here today. Welcome to Trinity Church. My name is Todd Arnett. I'm the lead pastor here. And I want to thank Chris Dowdy. He put that together, but not just by himself. That was you. Some of you in this service were in that video. So thank you so much for your help with that. Chris Petnack, as always, is doing a great job with us graphically being able to communicate what we're doing. And you join us today in a brand new series in a brand new year called Inverted. And we're going to be looking through the book of Daniel together. When you came in today, you got a Trinity this week. Inside, you have something that looks like this. If you'll take that out, that has some notes for us today to follow along. These also, if you look a little further, you'll notice that these are our home group notes. A lot of our home groups, like Steve said, are coming back this week. So you'll have those as prompts for your conversation this week. And hope that's a good uh, reunion uh, with the people from that group as you kind of kick back today or get back this weekend, this week. How are you doing today, by the way? You know, okay? I'm really glad you're here. This is exciting. We're going to kick off 
And I'm excited about this new series. We'll explain a little bit today the name of it and what it's about and where we're going. As we do that, I want to even give you once in a while <clears throat> during a series... I give you some books that I just think are worth a read that might go along with what we're doing. I have a couple for you during this series. The first one is by Larry Osborne called Thriving in Babylon. You'll see it up on the screen. I don't have the title in your notes, but you might want to write it down. Larry is the senior pastor of a great church called North Coast Church in uh, Oceanside, California. They're also an EV free church like we are. We look to them for a lot of great wisdom and just experiences. They've been a lot of places that we can learn from, and so we love going to different conferences and having and conversations with Larry and his team. Anyways, this book is a great companion. It is not kind of walk, it's not a commentary, it doesn't walk verse by verse through the book of Daniel, but incredible principles for how to live in a culture. I love how he says it, why hope, humility, and wisdom matter in a godless culture. So that's worth your read. The other one is from our own Rick Langer. Uh, he worked with Tim Muehlhoff, a book called Winsome Persuasion. And if you don't know, Rick was a pastor here at Trinity for a long time, very influential at this church. And so we're excited about this book for a couple of reasons. I love the, the uh, subtitle, Christian Influence in a Post-Christian World. It's quite simple. And how to do that in a winsome way. This idea, I love this phrase. I think it's in Ephesians, speak the truth in love. There's a way to do both, and we're going to look at that idea even today. What I'm really excited about, though, Rick is going to be back. He's going to be preaching the weekend of the 28th of January, later on this month. He'll be preaching in Daniel 4 during the morning, but then he'll be back that afternoon for what we're calling a winsome workshop. And... Um, Rick is going to take the principles of his book and be able to just kind of lay that out. I would say this is who I'd recommend. If you are a person who you are grabbing hold of Trinity's mission, you're someone who has either already been living that rooted and reaching life, or you're kind of warming up to the idea and wanting to know more, that's what this workshop is going to be about. How do you, uh, in a winsome way, in an engaging way, talk with a, a real thoughtfulness with the people in your world about issues that we all face. And so it's gonna be a great afternoon, three to five. It's a free event, come out for that. Gonna be held over in M105. We'd love for you to be a part of that. So put that on your calendars. The 28th of, Feb of January is gonna be a great, great day at Trinity Church. Well, let me do this. I want to uh, dive in today on this, uh, this new series. And what I'm gonna spend a little bit of time today is kind of just giving you an overview of the whole series and then we'll dive into our first chapter. We are, by the way, in the book of Daniel today if you wanna find your way there and your book Bible, electronic Bible, Daniel chapter one is where we'll begin in just a minute. But let me give you a little background kind of for this series and where it came from and why we decided to begin the year, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at this um, at this, uh, this passage, this book of the Bible. The reality is this, you would have to be someone who's had your head in the sand for the last 50 years to have not seen what has been going on even prior to that, but especially in this last 50 years, uh, a slide away from a nation that was built on Judeo-Christian ethics and principles and a, 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 a leadership direction that has really wandered from that. That is America, and what we call, like even the, the subtitle of Rick's book, we call it a post-Christian America. Let me even define that term. That doesn't mean that there are no more Christians in America, it just means that as a majority, as a group of people that generally have this Judeo-Christian ethic belief system, that has changed, that is no longer. Now, you can argue that, but I honestly think you're going to have a tough argument because everywhere you look, within literature, within media, within music, within educational institutions, within the court system, I could go on and on. There is example after example of that we don't live as a people according to the principles that God has laid out in his word. And so I'm not telling you anything new when I'm saying that. Our series then is talking about not so much trying to work on being angry about that, as much as how do we then live rightly in that? How are we to live as a group of Jesus followers in a culture that is not only not for Jesus, but at times oppositional towards him? And that's the stuff of what we're beginning to do and what we're beginning to look at during this series. Um, statistics often can be just helpful as far as like a objective just snapshot of something. And so I brought you one today that I thought was quite telling. It's from just over a year ago, 2016, from the Public Religion Research Institution. Now, I know every set of, of uh, statistics, every set of questions have within them a subjective 
point of view, uh, an angle of which they're trying to prove something. So I get that, but here's a snapshot. Just over a year ago, I want you to look, you can look, we're gonna put a circle around the bottom level of the, bright, of the darkest color of blue. Take a look at that group. If you look at the key, you'll notice that that's the, a white evangelical Protestant. And what we're looking at today, I just wanna show you a couple things. The goal is not that America would be full of white evangelical Protestants, especially the white part. Okay, but I do want you to see this. This is a snapshot of an example. Would you guys put that circle around that so we can kind of pay attention to the numbers that we're looking at? So take a look. This is what I want you to see. 2016, this was taking by those surveyed, taking a snapshot of how people would classify themselves. So they got to choose how would you put yourself? There's about what, 12 categories there. Where would you quote label yourself? Well, in those that are in the generation, and you'll see the ages there, 65 and plus, they would say, just even a year ago, that 26 out of 100, so basically one in four, one in four people would put themselves in that category of a white evangelical Protestant. You'll notice then the next group down, ages 50 to 64, that would be one, uh, two, 21 out of 100, so basically uh, 20%. And then the next stage down, that category um, 30 to 49, I just had a birthday. I'm still in this category. And so if you tell me I don't look a day over 50, we're going to have problems, okay? So I'm in that category. So my generation, 14 out of 100 would put themselves in that category, 14%. And then in the youngest generation on this survey, 18 to 29, 8%. So what I want you to do, take a look at that, that grab of those, the graph of those um, numbers, and just think of it this way. This is the Arnett family. My dad is in the oldest generation, 65 and plus. So what we would say is that in America today, one in four from his generation would put themselves, they would um, label themselves as that, as that category, white evangelical Protestant. Now skip two and get to my category, then we'd say that that group now has changed. That's actually now one in eight, so that's half basically of the group before, one in eight would say they fit that category. And then look at my son's generation, the youngest of those, and you'll see that it's basically one in 12, 8%, okay? So from in three generations, from one in four to one in 12. Now here's what I want you to catch today. And by the way, the other number that is striking about this chart, or this statistic, is the number at the top. You'll notice that number is called unaffiliated. We are a nation of nuns. That's not Catholic women in monasteries, but N-O-N-E-S, a nation of nuns. These are people who are unaffiliated, and you'll notice in the same way generational slices, you'll see that number go from 12 in 100 to 38 in 100. And the reason why we care about statistics, especially related to younger generations, is that generation is one generation away from leading this country. So here's my point, what am I after? Why am I showing you these stats? Well, it's not because I'm interested in America becoming more like me in terms of my ethnicity. It's not the white piece at all that matters. But I do want you to see related to the, the, those who would call themselves evangelicals, that number is shrinking generation over generation. And I don't think that's news to you. The nuns in ONES's category is growing generation over generation. All this is is a slice, it's an image, it's a snapshot of our country. And as I roll that out to you today and show you, as it were, America looking in a mirror, and you see that, here's the thing I wanna say from the very beginning of this series. Many of us lament these changes within our generations, but I wanna put something on the table. I wanna talk about that elephant in the room from the very beginning. If we're honest with ourselves, some of the reasons we lament that slide is because you're no longer in the majority. It is tough to be a person who's lived their whole lives in a group of the majority of maybe this nation and to see that change. It can be scary, even fearful. What does that look like when I'm slipping in terms of my class of people and we're actually becoming more of a minority in our country? That if you're gonna be honest as we embark on this series, that has got to be one of the things you come face to face with. Many of us, maybe not all, but many of us are very scared of that reality even more than the fact of the morality and the attitudes and the worldviews of our country. And so here's what I wanna to do today. This is what I wanna do. I know you're like, Todd, what an encouraging message. I have encouragement for you. The first is this, I want you to be careful that as you mourn this cultural drift, that you don't go back to this attitude of how good it used to be. 
Because here's why. Even the Bible tells us that's dangerous thinking. Look at Ecclesiastes 7.10. Solomon says this, Do not say, why were the old days better than these? The good old days, why? For it is not wise to ask such questions. He's not saying that you're necessarily even wrong by having that perspective today, but what he is saying is you have no idea how to judge today because we always need history to be able to see what God is doing. I cannot accurately look at a slice of 2018 and know who we are or what God is doing. I have to wait and watch God unfold. So Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, be very careful to not live in yesteryear. But I want you to see this. I remember being at a conference. This would be like seven years ago now. And I remember a pastor talking about this idea of post-Christian America. And, and as we were listening, and he was rattling off statistics and, and caricatures of what our culture is, I remember myself sitting there and kind of going, oh, God, this is scary. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm frightened of where we're going. But this is how he concluded his time. There has never been a better day to live as a Jesus follower, as a person of contrast in your culture than there is today. When you follow Jesus, people will notice because whereas before we might have had a cultural Christianity, a cultural reality of some morals that we did and didn't talk about, now that that has changed, when you choose to follow Jesus before, that might not have stood out much at all, but today it does. And for that reason, we should take heart. This is what Jesus said to his followers, the very first sermon he gave, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Look at the screen. You, I know in our Christmas Eve service, we said Jesus is the light of the world. Look what he says. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what I want us to be about in this series. How do the people in our relational worlds see our good deeds, see us shine, and as a result, want to know the Jesus that we love? That's what we're after. So here's what we're going to do as we dive into this series. <clears throat> Every week, I want to remind us of four central truths that are really important for us. They're in your notes. And I want you to see those as, as really what we're going to walk in. We're going to walk in a tension. Now, when you hear the word tension, you often think of that as a negative word. But think of it this way. If your bed springs that you slept on last night or whatever foamy components you have in your mattress, if they didn't live in tension, you would have had a horrible night's sleep. Because a spring expanded does you no good. You want it to live in tension because that would, is what gives you a sense of, of rest. Tensions don't have to be a negative thing, and so we're going to walk a line of balance in this series, trying to stay away from the extremes of two things. On the one hand, we want to stay away from succumbing to the culture and just simply blending in and walking apart from what Jesus would say, but on the other hand, we're not going to be here in culture bash for the next eight weeks. There's no value in that either. We're going to walk the line that says, God, we want to live in the tension of all these realities because our goal is to shine your light to our world. So here's those four truths I want us to be thoughtful of every week. Number one, Christians have always lived in oppositional cultures. Christians have always lived in oppositional cultures. If you don't know if that's for sure, read the book of Acts. From the very beginning, when Jesus ascended to the Father, from the very next days, they were being first persecuted by their, the Jewish leadership group, and after that, soon thereafter, it was by Rome. And if you're not sure that really happened beyond, then just simply read church history. We have always lived among a people who thought this way of Jesus is, is something that we're concerned about. We want to do what we can to keep it aside and keep it quiet. We've always lived in that kind of a culture. We're not new to this. Number two, our enemy is Satan, not people. Our enemy is Satan, not people. Here's the deal. I know in a room this size today, there are many of us that have very passionate views about a lot of things. They would include areas of politics. They would include areas of worldview and morality. And you, you, when you get on that idea, get concerned about that thought, man, the people that are on the other side of that view, it is so easy to tag them as the enemy. But I want you to hear this crystal clear. Anytime you look in scripture, you're gonna find that anytime that people oppose God, 
God always was very understandable and very aware of the fact that they were pawns in an enemy's hand. Satan is always the one behind what is ever averse to what God is doing in a world. And though someone might be under his control and be acting on his agenda at a time doesn't mean that they're not going to change. Think of you, think of the people in this room. There was a time when we walked apart from what God said was true. And we were also in that, the, the Bible is so clear in Ephesians 2, you also walked under the leadership, the control of the leader, of the ruler of the heir. Of, of this world apart from what God is doing, but God did a work and changed you. That means God can do a work and he can change them. So we wanna keep mindful of that. Number three, God calls us to rescue people, not the culture. God calls us to rescue people, not the culture. Here's where I go with that. I remember as a young youth pastor, this would have been in like the mid 90s, that was a very trendy thing within ministry circles is how are we gonna change the culture? And I remember getting on that bandwagon and processing all those thoughts. But I gotta tell you, when I went to my Bible and I began asking questions, I just asked the question, where in the Bible does it say that Jesus' followers are called to change a culture? And what I keep seeing is that Jesus' followers are called to be about influencing people to know Jesus. Because if you do this, if you say, as my role, I'm to influence a culture, what you're doing is you're skipping the people who actually do influence the culture, and that's other people. God's called us to be about a rescue mission to people, and as people are transformed, so transforms the culture. But if we go right to the end game, we're supposed to do something to transform the culture, we miss, and I don't think the Bible ever calls us to that. Finally, number four, disagree with opinions, not people. Disagree with opinions, not people. Here's what I mean by that. Both in the church and outside of it, I have often, think of, think of this way, think of it in your frame. Has there ever been a time that you were very passionate, you were very sold on a certain idea, and in which you had a lot of conversations with other people who opposed you? Most of us would say yes. Now, was there ever a time that when that opinion changed? You changed your mind. I have, and the problem is when I have those kind of contests with other people and I begin to align their view with their total person, then I write them off because I write off their view. Instead, what we want to do is we want to say, God has given us clarity as to how we ought to walk. You have a, an, a, the opportunity to speak the truth in love. I'm not asking you to change your opinions away from God's design, but for those who don't share them, don't write them off. Because God wants us to be a people, just like Rick's book, of winsome persuasion. And that's the way we do that, is we continue to love people even if they believe and walk in a way different than what Jesus has said. Those four central truths we're going to look at week over week to remind ourselves as we dive in. And today, here's our now what idea, what we're walking away with, what we want to be about. Be resolved to obey God while still showing respect towards those who disagree with you. This was so perfectly illustrated by Daniel and his friends in chapter one. Be resolved to follow God while showing respect to those who oppose you. Let's dive in in your notes. Number one, God is no less present to you when your world is flipped upside down. God is no less present to you when your world is flipped upside down. Here's what we want to look at today. I want to give you the historical context of this book of Daniel so that you can appreciate what he and his friends went through. It begins this way. Daniel is the author of the book that is named after him, and within it, he records some amazing things, an extraordinary account of God's people and God's purposes while in exile. All of the book of Daniel takes place while in Babylon. We'll talk about that in a minute, why that even happened, but that's the context for what's going on. Secondly, this is a really powerful thing. The book of Daniel was actually originally written in two different languages, Chapter 1 and then chapters 8 through 12 are all written in Hebrew, which we would think of rightly that most of the Old Testament was written in the people of Israel's language. However, chapters 2 through 7 are all written in Aramaic. Now, Aramaic would have been the language of the day. Everyone would have understood, even those who are being exiled to Babylon as Jews, they would have understood Aramaic as the common language of the day. In the New Testament, that language was Koine Greek. That's what everyone read and spoke and understood. So what Daniel does, and I think when you look at the, the, the 
the content of chapters 2 through 7, you see that Daniel is making readily accessible the truth and the power of Yahweh God in the midst of an entire world that would be able to have access to it and read it. And we'll see that more as we dive in. Finally, this book divides really sharply in two halves. The first six chapters that we'll be looking at are the narratives. Many of the narratives, if you've grown up in church, you've heard these narratives because they make great flannel graph stories, right? That is great, cool pictures and, and amazing things that God does. We'll look at those six chapters. The second six chapters, though, do this. They're all prophetical visions that Daniel receives that fit into the context historically of the first six chapters. So the book is relatively chronological, chapters 1 through 6, but then 7 through 12 fit in the historical context of 1 through 6, and we'll see that a little bit later. <clears throat> this book covers from 605 B.C. to about 530 B.C., and it's hard to do B.C. math. That's about 75 years. Here's the wild thing. Daniel was born about 620 B.C., so where that's going to place him today, we have a lot of students in the room this hour. He was 15 years old. If you're 15, raise your hand right now. If you're 15 today, okay? Good. So that group of students around the room, that's how old our character is that we're going to look at today. This Daniel was their age, sophomore in high school age, young adult. And that's what we're going to dive into. So let's do that. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. It's on the screen. It's in your Bible. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God, this is Nebuchadnezzar, in Babylonia, and put the treasure, put the treasure in the house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. This chief leader, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years. After that, they were in to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from the tribe of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, <clears throat> Abednego. Here's what I want you to see today. I want you to get a little bit of the lay of the land of the context that was going on in these four young men's lives. Because when you think that America has been on this continual slide, and I wouldn't disagree with you, when you think about how your life has been turned upside down in your lifetime, think about what these young men endured in the span of 15 years. One day, they were in the nobility. They were young, rising stars in the line of Judah, which was the kingly line of the lower tribe of Judah, the nation of Judah. They were going to rise within that system. Their nation is besieged and over, overturned, and they're put on a cart to Babylon. That seems like a pretty upside-down world to me. That's the life that they lived, and it's helpful for us as we're processing how they lived and how they walked with the kinds of challenges that we face. First off, take a look at the map. This is what happened. You saw in the text that God finally gave Judah over to Babylon and had her people exiled to a foreign land. If you look over here to the far left, that's where Jerusalem is. And you'll notice that Babylon's pretty much due east, but the problem is that's a desert of death. Nobody ever traveled through that. So they went all the way up and over to Babylon, and that was the, the trail, that was the path they took to, to be let, kept into exile. And when I think of this whole idea, if you hear this today out of, out of any kind of a vacuum, you're wondering, why did God hand over his people to be exiled, to be defeated, besieged? We saw that even in other Old Testament narratives. Besieging was basically the beginning of a slow death. We put an army around the walls of your city. We don't let anyone go in or out, and ultimately you're going to starve to death. So that was the way that they took over Jerusalem, Jerusalem caves, and then they began to cart off their people. Daniel and his three friends were among that first group that were to go. So within that, the question is, why would God do this? And we're just going to sum up that whole idea from a verse from 2 Chronicles 36. It's on the screen. But they mocked God's messengers, 
They despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord, watch this, was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. God had exhausted his patience, and you'll see as you read throughout the judges, throughout the time of the kings, and through the time of the prophets, God again and again is calling his people to repent. And again and again, they're chasing after the nations around them. They're chasing after what they valued. And ultimately, God said, I have put up with this. I have allowed you to stray this long. I'm finally doing. And by the way, back in Deuteronomy, remember that? What did he say? Blessings on you when you follow me, curses on you when you walk away. And one of those was, I will exile you to another nation. God finally makes good on what he promised all the way back in Deuteronomy. So Daniel presents, and I want you to see this, Daniel presents these events here in Daniel 1, not as military or political overthrows. It wasn't about how strong Nebuchadnezzar was. Look at the context. God delivered. That's what we just read. God handed over his people to Nebuchadnezzar because of their waywardness. And I want you to see this because we're going to see it all the way through these six chapters of Daniel, a really firm grasp that he and his friends had was simply this. God, it's in your notes, God is in control of who is in control. Do not miss over and over again God's providential power and his supernatural power to continue to lead what he is, his design is to be. And I love this quote comes from Larry's book, Thriving in Babylon. God is in control of who is in control. Daniel absolutely with conviction believed that. And by the way, Daniel's the human author of this book. Daniel's the one who wrote that. God is in control. God delivered Judah over because of their sinfulness. And Nebuchadnezzar was simply the, the tool that God used in that account. Daniel's account of this exile is through a very specific lens. We saw earlier, he's one from a royal family of Judah, one of the first taken away and with a specific purpose of indoctrinating him and his fellow exiles in the way of Babylon. And we talked about it earlier. He was a part of the best and the brightest of Judah. Imagine his world now being turned completely upside down. He's become subservient. He is an exile. He is a man with no country. And he's brought to a place to be indoctrinated. You'll notice that one of the first things that happens to Daniel and his friends is they're given new names. You think about your name. You guys that raised your hand, you're 15 years old. You've been called what you've been called probably your whole life, unless you had some you know, crazy experience and you decided, I'm going to be Elizabeth today. But either way, you've been who you've been. Now watch this. So Daniel not only had been who he had been his whole life, but on top of that, in this culture, this Jewish culture, your name, and, and really throughout the, the, the world at this time, your name was indicative of who you were. Todd is, is, is whatever it is and whatever you think it is and whatever it means, but I don't necessarily think of myself through that lens. I am Todd is what people call me. Well, in this case, Daniel was the sum total of who Daniel was. That's how people thought of their name. So to change somebody's name was epic. It was a huge upturn in their lives. And they were given these names that were all of pagan derivation, where they all related before to these things are true of Yahweh. Now these things are true of Babylon's gods. So this was incredibly unnerving and upending. This is the world in which they lived. This is why this is helpful for us that we can see, God, we don't have it this bad, but we're learning principles of how to walk in our world. Number two in your notes today, God blesses our choices to honor him in the midst of opposition. God blesses our choices to honor him even in the midst of opposition. Everything that we're gonna read contextually, historically, about this, this uh, six chapters of Daniel are really a more extreme cultural upside downness than we live in today. And, and as we walk this out, you'll see that, like we've already said, none of you have worried about being exiled to somewhere else tomorrow, okay? That's not on your radar. But it'd be like this. If we really were doing a one-for-one, one, it would be something like this. North Korea would invade America and take its best and brightest 15-year-olds to go over and indoctrinate in the ways of communism. That would be a really one-for-one one of what happens. Really what's more of a like-like is another part of Israel's history. It's when the prophets were coming to Judah. 
And they were saying to the people, if you don't turn your ways, God is going to do to you what he did to your sister nation, the nation of Israel to the north. When Assyria came and defeated and scattered them, he's going to do the same to you. That's more the era that we find ourselves. But even as we look at a, a group of people in a narrative further down the road than we are, we can still take heart from the principles that we learn from them. Let's read on to discover this first challenge they faced. Chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, and the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than all the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants, watch this, for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he, the supervisor over them, agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine they were given to drink and gave them vegetables instead. This is probably one of my favorite narratives of the entire Old Testament, and you read it and you're like, why? I mean, it's, it's about food. Well, that might be why, right there. Um, I really enjoy food. But, but this is the reason why. I feel like this is more relatable than some of the other narratives we're going to get into in the rest of Daniel. I don't know the last time that I have feared for my life if I didn't bow to an idol. But I do know what it's like to face issues where I know God has spoken clearly, but I decide to slowly compromise. That's what I love about this narrative of Daniel in chapter one. Daniel resolved. Daniel made a choice not to defile himself, and how he did it is so powerful for us by way of principle. That's what we want to look at. Let's first look at this idea. <clears throat> when you think, remember what we talked about? Their lives have been turned upside down, and this is what I think is a little bit, to, and to our lens, a little bit almost comical. Of all the things they're going to face, Daniel's going to make a stand on not eating pork. I mean, seriously, of all, their whole world's been turned upside down. They've been given brand new names. They don't live with their parents or anyone from home anymore. They're transplanted into another nation, and they're going to make a stand about eating things according to a kosher diet that God had outlined in Scripture. Some of us would just go, that seems like such a small thing to stand up for. But watch this. God had made it so clear to his people all the way back in Exodus and Deuteronomy, this is a dietary code I want you to live by. Anyone from a Jewish background would have not only known this, but would have observed this their whole life. Now, their whole life had been in Israel or Judah, and that made that much more easy to maintain. But now that they're transplanted into a pagan nation of Babylon, this is going to be a challenge, and they saw it from day one. What I want you to see is this. I want you to see, for us today, the Bible's really clear. In Acts chapter 9, Peter has this vision, and in it, God says, there is no such thing as an unclean food in this new covenant relationship I have with you. We don't have this stipulation, so there's no one for one that we'll be looking at today with a dietary code, but... Daniel and his friends had a clear understanding. God has called us not to defile ourselves with those foods. Instead, we need to figure out if there's another way. And that's really the, the, the conflict they were brought to. Now, I don't even know. I, I know that someone might have lived a certain way their whole life, but one of the things that they could eat, there's a whole list if you know much about the kosher diet. There's many things that you might enjoy on a daily basis. Yesterday, Kindy and I had a great day. We got to go down to an aquarium in San Diego, and our whole goal was to first look at fish, and then with my Red Lobster gift card, to go and eat them, okay? <laughs> Not the same fish. We didn't eat any from the aquarium, but that was our goal. And it was interesting, as I remember my plate coming to me, I was thinking about preaching today, I realized everything on my plate was banished from a Jewish dietary code. I had all shellfish all over my plate. And I thought, thank you, God, I don't live under that. You know, this is awesome. So I enjoyed my, my shrimp and lobster, and it was awesome. But my point is, is that for even people coming from a Jewish background, not only the sense of I've never eaten this my whole life, but I'm sure there were people doing the math. There are a lot worse things we're going to face than this. 
to just roll over and do what they say. It's Daniel and his friends who say, you know what? We believe that everything that God has given us to do, we're called to do, and we're going to try to walk in that way. Nothing is too small. So look at what his friends did. They resolved. They chose not to adapt or blend into their new surroundings. But here's the key thing I want you to see. Look what they didn't do. They didn't protest. They didn't pick it. They didn't make life hard for the people who were in power. And I think about this reality and I think about what happens in a post-Christian America as we begin as a nation to slide away from what we believe God has said clearly we're to live. What is our go-to? It's usually social media. It's usually calling the newspaper. It's usually making some kind of ruckus rather than thinking relationally how is there any other way I can engage living in the truth without ruining and burning every bridge around me. That's what I love about this narrative. They didn't do any of those things. Instead, they said, is there any way that we can do this? And look at what they do. They not only ask if there's a way that they could live in God's design of their diet, but they also said, could we bring up an alternative? Can we bring up an idea? So many times when we are frustrated with decisions going on around us, we have no alternative. We're just mad at how things are. This is what I love about Daniel and his friends. They respectfully asked, and they gave an alternative in its place. I want you to see a couple things. Number one, they were firmly committed and believed the idea that God is in control of who's in control. And one of those great things, you read it in your text, this is what it said. God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Don't read between the lines. Don't read the fact that Daniel got on this guy's good side, because it doesn't say that. It says that God was at work in that official's heart. God was doing something Daniel and his friends could not see, but he was preparing the way for there to be an option, an alternative. How many times do you and I get in a situation where we believe there's no way I can honor God in this circumstance? And so often it's because we've shortchanged the fact that God may be at work in someone else's life or in other circumstances. We just go right to what we can see and we assume God's not going to provide a way. These men asked, is there a way that we can still honor our God and believe that God may be at work in other circumstances around them? And he was. He was involved in this man's life. As they offered this alternative, it was very measurable. It wasn't vague. It was very clear on the alternative, vegetables and water. And by the way, <clears throat> the Jewish dietary code did not call for people to be vegetarians. So don't, don't mistake that. It wasn't a call that they had to. They just said, this is the simplest way. Vegetables and water, we know we'll stay within God's design for that. Test us with this in 10 days and let's see how things go. I think it's such a powerful example to us of how we should respond. They respectfully asked to opt out, but gave the one in command an alternative that could be measured. I have not done this well numerous times in my life. So the example I'm about to tell you is not indicative of the way that I have always acted. And for those things I regret. But there was a time, my son was a freshman in high school <clears throat> up at Serrano. <clears throat> and he was there and uh, it was the end of his first semester of his freshman year. He's a 14 year old young man. At the end of the semester, in uh, their English class, they'd been reading a book and at the end, they watched the movie of that book, which I think is entirely appropriate. The problem was there was no letter sent out to parents and the version of this particular book contained nudity in it that was shown in the classroom with no hesitation. And I remember him coming home that day and telling me, Dad, this happened at school today. And I said, what? How, how could that happen? That doesn't seem. So I realized, and I believe my son, but I wanted to know more to the story, so I contact his teacher. And, and this is what I gotta tell you. I will I'll be very candid. In my mind, if this is true, I wonder what the local newspaper would think of this. That was going through my head. But I gotta tell you, God had been doing a thing in my life over the, the years prior to that where I had begun to believe that God wants to use me as a person of influence in my relational world. My kids' teachers are in my relational world. So I thought, God, is there any good way to approach this? The teacher did not respond for a few different correspondences. I changed the, the approach and then they, the teacher finally did. And I simply had the conversation, asked questions, 
and wanted to know why this movie was shown. And the answers given me really reflected a worldview very contrary to mine. This is nothing worse than they see on TV. It's not what my son watches on TV. And I'm wondering if there's any way that there can be, and watch this, the damage was done. There's nothing I can do about that showing of that movie, but maybe something can be done about the future. So I simply asked, is there any way that you could consider, there are multiple versions of this book available, are there, of movies, is there any way you could consider a different version? The conversation, I was not angry, I was not hostile, it was not defensive coming back, we had a very fine conversation, and then afterwards the teacher said, I'll see what I can do. The teacher met with the other English department uh, teachers, and as a result, she called me in about a month and said, just wanted you to know, at our meeting we decided to go with a different version of the movie, we won't be showing that again. Here's what I want you to see, the result, I think was honoring to God, but the result is not even the issue in my mind. The issue was the approach. I knew that if I just go out and burn a bridge with this teacher, there's no way we're going to have an opportunity to be influential in her life. But instead, if there's a way to retain the relationship and be able to at least have a conversation about something that I would offer as an alternative, maybe there's hope to see there be change and the relationship intact so I could in the future be a person of relational influence in her life. By the way, a couple of years later, my daughter had the same teacher. And so we had a new opportunity to be relational in her life rather than burn that bridge. I have not done this often. I'm not touting something today, but I am telling you, when you will move forward in the issues of your life in which you have conviction, but as a person who wants to be a person of influence, you can speak the truth in love. There's a way to do this without always just simply going to a place of protest and picketing and making people's lives horrible. That's what Daniel did, that's his example. Look at this quote, Gleason Archer Jr. in his commentary says this, the whole narrative of Daniel relates a series of contests between false, the false gods of human invention and the one true sovereign, Lord and creator of heaven and earth. And even though this one is not, quote, spectacular, you're gonna get to some of those even in our next chapter, even though this is much more a providential way of God providing for his people, do not miss, it is this constant tension, the book of Daniel, between Yahweh, even being Yahweh and sovereign with an exiled people, and those gods of Babylonian invention. This is the first of those contests, and God continues to show himself strong. I wanna tell you this, I have looked at this narrative in Daniel 1 probably ever since I was about 15. And I remember reading over this narrative and I've asked myself the question every time I read it. You see, Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, they were not the only four Jewish men that were brought into exile into Babylon. Most likely there were dozens from all over Judah that were brought and in our record of what we have, none of them, none of them resolved not to defile themselves but these four and I've asked myself the question, Todd, what would you have done? Would you have been the fifth in that group to say I resolve not to defile myself, or would you have simply succumbed to pressure and gone the way with every other Jewish young man in that group? I know me, you know you, and I know at other instances in my life, I've simply chosen to go along with the crowd, totally recognizing what God would have me do in an instance, but deciding it was just easier to go with the flow. I wanna give you hope today. If you're someone, even as a follower of Jesus, who has really had a problem standing up to certain pressures in your life, there's hope. It begins with saying, God, I recognize I did not stand and walk your way in this instance, would you forgive me? And secondly, God, the next time I have opportunity, because I know I will, help me to resolve not to defile myself. There's always hope, even in the midst of our past failures. Finally, number three today in our notes, God's goal might not be to extract you from this culture, but to use you as a person of influence in it. Look how our passage finishes today, verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and understanding, of learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, a chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. 
In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And look at this last verse. And Daniel remained there until the first year of Cyrus. Here's what I want you to watch. So often, so often God enables us, God does things in our lives that produces great success, and we completely miss the way he was supernaturally working. Look what it said at the very beginning. God gave them the ability to have great wisdom and learning. God is the one behind this. God is enabling them. God gave them these gifts in which they thrived even though in exile in this pagan Babylon. That's what we have to keep coming back to. God is the hero of the book of Daniel. God used obedience by Daniel and his friends, but God is the one who always gets the credit. And God was working in powerful ways to bring this conclusion. What I want you to see today is this, as we close today. Those last words to me are so important. It says at the end, this is Daniel again pinning this. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Historically, the first year of King Cyrus was 70 years later. That would make Daniel 85 years old. We have no record that Daniel ever went back to Jerusalem. We have no record that the people, the inhabitants of the nation of Babylon, ever had a massive repentance during Daniel's time. But what we do have record of is four young men who resolved not to defile themselves and saw God do amazing things in the midst of their obedience. That's the principle we're going to walk forward with. Those are the things we want to learn from. That's our now what statement as we close today and where we're walking this week. Be resolved to obey God while still showing respect towards those who disagree with you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this, um, this new series, this new uh, study in the book of Daniel. And God, we will find principle after principle, we'll find idea after idea, example after example of how we are to live, how we're to walk when we consider a culture that is walking in the opposite direction of what you've said. God, help us in this series not to develop a culture-bashing attitude, but God, likewise, in that tension, help us not simply to succumb. Help us not to simply blend in and become like everything around us. Help us know how to walk this tightrope, God, this balance of being a people who follow Jesus, but being a people who are winsome, being a people who are resolved to live your way, but respectful of those who disagree with us. God, help us embrace these lessons from Daniel's life, his, his example to us, and help us to be a people that ultimately, at the end of the day, bigger than seeing a culture transformed, God, we pray that we would see people transformed one at a time for those that we interact with, those that we do life with, those in our relational world. Father, we love you. We want to be a people who live your life this week. Thank you so much for all you are to us. Help us live in obedience towards you. We love you and we pray in Jesus' great name. Amen. We're really glad that you started off this new year a new series with us. This morning, there'll be people down front who'd love to pray with you. If there's anything that, that you need prayer for today, otherwise, have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.